So, so I don't subject you, thank you, Patrick. I don't subject you to my French, which is at yet barely existent, um, but whatever exists is thanks to the Alliance Francaise in Aix-en-Marseille. Um, yeah. But I did, with the help of Nicolas and Pascal, translate my slides into French. So I'll give the talk in English. Uh, any, of course, any mistakes in the French, the responsibilities are solely mine. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to try and give a talk with a lot of pictures to talk a little bit about the machinery of translation surfaces, which is something that Nicola and I and Pascal and many other people in this room, Anton, work on, and how it can help answer questions about, well, you've heard about two things in the first two talks. You heard about so a little bit about integrable systems in the first talk, and you heard about geodesics in the second talk. And both of them will show up here. Um, and I'll try and make the, the connections a little bit clear. And I will, OK, and, and to be very fair, the connection to the little prince is it's a little bit of a stretch, but you'll see. OK, so I, I, let me start by saying that this is an extremely, extremely special place for me. Uh, the first time I came to Serum was 20 years ago. Um, and I've benefited enormously from being here. I came as a graduate student uh, to a summer school. Um, it's just, and, and the people here from that time, from you know, Olivia in particular, but, but everyone at Serum has just been magnificent. And, and in fact, you know, I think all of us here have benefited from the amount of work that makes this a really, really special and magical place to do math. Um, yes, so thank you. Um, and then a big thanks to Nicola, and of, uh, who is my partner in crime for the semester, um, and to Pascal, and a uh, huge thanks also. So you saw, many of you saw the exhibition uh, about Mariam in the, in the Café des Calanques. You may have seen also the exhibit on the space of surfaces outside. And Stephanie is in just incredible at the work she does to make this kind of publicity and communication for math. So a huge thanks to Stephanie, and I think it's just remarkable, the work that Stephanie does. OK, so I want to try and tell a story about mathematics, you know, because I think mathematics is about telling stories. And I want to tell a story that starts with geometry, because as in the title of my semester, you know, I talk about renormalization, but also about visualization. I think that, that geometry really gives many, many different points of entry to mathematics, sort of visual, tactile, and artistic. And in fact, I urge many of you to see, we have an artist in residence, Alison Martin, who's just completed a really stunning and beautiful sculpture with bamboo and cloth. You'll see it later this evening at the reception. You can see it, I think, I think it's on its already way to the reception. Um, and she will also be coming later to make a larger scale sculpture for Serum. Um, and I think geometry is this, is it's a living and exciting subject. Uh, and I want to share this, even very basic questions. And so when I say basic questions, let's start with some really, really concrete and classical objects. Um, you might be wondering why the dodecahedron is by itself when you usually see it sort of, you see maybe the tetrahedron by itself, right? The other, the other two are, other four are sort of paired up, right? The cube and the octahedron are buddies, and the icosahedron and the dodecahedron are buddies. Uh, in duality, but for me, the tetrahedron, the octahedron, the cube, and the icosahedron are going to be kind of one family, and the dodecahedron is going to be something different, uh, which is why I've drawn it. Well, OK, it's a little bit of a lie. Why I've drawn it this way is I stole this picture from the internet, and it was drawn this way on the internet. But this is my explanation for why I chose this particular depiction, uh, is the dodecahedron is something genuinely different. And I'll try and explain why it's different. So the question we're going to consider is the question of singular closed geodesics. Or in this context, the word saddle connection doesn't make as much sense, but uh, we'll, we'll use this word as well, and I'll try and explain the connection in a minute. But let me call it a closed singular geodesic. Imagine you are living on the surface of one of these platonic solids. Of course, if you're living in a face, it just looks like you're living in Euclidean space. You're living on a flat surface. If you're even on an edge, if you're in the interior of an edge, well, you still have 360 degrees of angles you can travel in, right? There's 180 on each face. But when you're at a corner, now you're experiencing kind of positive curvature. You have less angle than 2 pi um, on, these, on these surfaces, right? So you have at the tetrahedron, you have just an angle of pi at the corner, all the way up to the dodecahedron where you have an angle of 9 pi over 5 at a corner. 
And so close, so, so we can still talk about geodesics. We have a metric, we have a notion, a flat metric with some singularity th at these points. But we have the notion of traveling straight and we can travel straight over edges. And I wanna start at a corner, come back to itself and not pass through any other corner. So what I'm gonna call a closed singular geodesic. Okay. And the question is, well, do they exist? <laughs> Right? I give you a definition, but I didn't tell you whether there's actually anything that's living in the definition. Are there closed singular? Because in particular, I don't want to pass through any other corners because I don't know what it means to pass through another corner. I want to start at a corner, come back to where I started without passing through another corner. So do these exist? So this story actually goes back quite a ways. Um, it goes back to Paul Stackel, at least. Um, so this is a paper from 1906. Um, in a journal, in uh, a Sicilian journal, a journal published in Palermo. So you can see uh, the little words in Italian on top, and then the paper is in German. Uh, Stackel, that's, he was one of the founders of the field of integrable systems. Um, and he was interested in this question about, well, geodesic lines on polyhedra. I don't have much German, but I have that much at least. Um, and what it means to do geodesic flow on polyhedra. So Stackel had or, or, uh, introduced this and started to think about some of these questions. And uh, so had his colleague Rodenberg, at, uh, Han who was his colleague at Hanover. And in fact, these papers are in basically back-to-back -back issues of this journal. You can see he refers to Stackel. Um, he refers to Stackel's paper earlier in this journal. Um, and they have a little bit of a disagreement on how you, for instance, so one of them actually says maybe you should be able to extend lines through singular points because you could take sort of left hand and right hand limits and try and decide, but we're gonna stick with you can't go through singular points and continue. Okay, so now here's the connection to the little prince. Uh, the, the, the story that we're going to tell is that you know, we live at one corner of this platonic solid and we have a sheep and we live on this planet and we wanna take our sheep for a walk and, but we're also avid gardeners, so we plant a rose at every other corner. And if you remember the little prince, the sheep wants to eat the rose. And so we want to go for a walk and not have the sheep eat the rose. Okay, so can we do this? Can we go for a walk, come home? And of course, we're, we're mathematicians, so we're very efficient. We only walk along geodesic paths. Of course, this would be easy if we allowed ourselves to not walk along geodesic paths, but we don't walk, we have to walk along geodesic paths. We wanna come back to where we started and we don't wanna eat the rose. Uh, this picture is taken from a video that we'll show you at the end of the talk, uh, a number file video created by Brady Haran um, when I was at MSRI. So it's a still, many of the pictures are stills from this video. So here's a theorem. This is not so hard to prove if you get bored in the rest of this talk, I urge you to try and prove it. Um, there are none on these four. Okay. Um, the tetrahedron, the octahedron, the cube, and the icosahedron have none. And now I'm actually going to give you a proof. I'm gonna give you a proof of one case. I'm gonna give you a proof in the case of the tetrahedron that this doesn't exist. And the proof in the case of the tetrahedron is going to come from um, an idea that's very, very important in dynamical systems. And it, it was so important that it was kind of, it was discovered twice. So once by Fox and Kirshner in the 1930s. Um, and uh, later in, uh, in the Soviet Union by Zalmyakov and Katok. And it's this, it's this process of unfolding Okay, so it was so, 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 so in fact, it's such a nice idea that it was discovered many more times than twice. So Serge points out that, that many people have come up with this idea because it's kind of a very natural idea. And I'll describe it in exactly what it is in a second. In fact, you can kind of already see it here. Um, you know, so, so they're talking about this finite polyhedra, each circuit changes by the sum and, 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 and they're, they're, they're going to have a rationality condition in here. And they're already talking about billiards, an illustration of the billiard ball problem. So it's gonna to connect to, to billiards in polyhedra. And they're talking about what are called rational polyhedra, the sum ordinary polyhedra where the sum of all angles at any corner is a rational multiple of pi, which is certainly true for our platonic solids. 
also point out that they're citing these papers that I showed you earlier, Stockel and Rodenberg. And I should also point out, I don't think this audience needs it, but when I give this talk, sometimes people ask me, did people really have their pictures on papers in the, and I said, no, 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 these are just pictures we got from the internet and stuck them on top of the papers. So they didn't actually have pictures. Um, Fox is of course a famous, became, is a famous algebraic topologist. This was a paper written when he was a master's student. Kirshner went on to become a very well-known American rocket scientist, he worked at JPL, um, but wrote this paper as a master's. One last thing I'll point out, which is kind of fun, received by the editors of the annals and then accepted by them and then transferred to this journal. This paper got published in Duke. So I don't know, how would you feel if your paper got accepted by the annals and then <laughs> they were like, you know, actually we're just gonna send it to Duke, Duke will publish it. So I guess publishing was different in the 1930s as well. Uh, is, that, is that due to anti-Semitism? That is a good question, but given that it was accepted, yeah, I mean, Burkhoff certainly was very anti-Semitic. Um, so I don't know. That's a very good question. I don't know what the story behind this is. Okay, so now we're going to play, we're gonna prove a theorem. Uh, we're gonna prove the theorem for the tetrahedron. So here is my terrible drawing of the tetrahedron. Um, it's got four vertices, but I've made these lines. So there's this arrow lines in the back. And the reason I made these lines is because actually I don't like to draw in three dimensions as you might tell. I wanna draw in two dimensions. And that green thing that I drew was supposed to be a piece of a trajectory. So I draw it in two dimensions and you look at just for right now, just look at the piece on the left. I draw the four vertices, the, the dotted lines are lines that I fold on. The arrows on the edges are how I identify things. And of course there's still four vertices. There's pink, yellow, red, and then blue, all the four blue, all the three blue come together when I fold it up. And this green trajectory, I, I hit there and then I go with the identification. But what if I'm lazy and I don't want to turn 180 degrees? I just want to draw it going straight. Well, then I just draw another copy of my picture, my net, and I just draw that rotated 180 degrees. And now, if you look at this, if you, and I, now I just keep going straight, and now I can just sort of come up the bottom, right? And now everything's identified not with the rotation, but with just a translation, right? Everything is glued with the translation now. And of course, I think we have an idea, a good idea of what the surface is now, right? It's a rhombus with opposite sides identified by translation. Okay, so I just, I drew another copy here um, just to show you the, the trajectory continuing. I could just keep drawing more copies and I could tile the whole plane. And now my question becomes, and now my straight line trajectories are just straight lines in this plane. And my question becomes, can I draw a straight line trajectory starting from a point of one color to another point of the same color without passing through another corner, right? And I mean, I think we can all see that you can't <laughs> and you can prove it using evens and odds, right? You can just prove it using a, a very simple you know, parity argument here. And so, um, or if you like, if you're a number theorist, you can say torsion points, um, but, it's, it's, this, is, this is the proof. This picture is the proof that you can't do this on the tetrahedron. Okay. What about the cube? I don't draw the octahedron yet. I draw the cube for now. So of course, I draw the cube because of course everyone here has moved house at least one time, so you know what this is. You put together a box and you, you, know, you put your stuff in it. But of course, we're not just gonna simply put together a box, we're gonna take four boxes and we're going to identify parallel sides by translation. So if you look here, because when I glued my box together, I was rotating 90 degrees to glue things. So now I need four copies if I wanna just glue things by translation. What I'm doing here is I'm taking what's called the translation cover of my surface. If you like complex analysis, what we, what we have on a platonic solid is we have a differential, a, a, a mirror-morphic differential on the sphere of in the, in the case of the tetrahedron, it's what's called a mirror-morphic quadratic differential. In this cube case, in fact, it's a mirror-morphic quartic differential, oh, sorry, um, three pi over two, yeah, quartic differential. And I need four copies. So quadratic, I needed two copies. Quartic, I need four copies to make a surface where I just glue things with translation. And if you look every side, F, for instance, F, F0 here has a, there'll be a horizontal F0 over here, and that's what it's glued to. Every side has a friend that it's glued to. 
And if you do this gluing, you don't get a torus anymore. You, in this case, you get a genus nine surface, um, but it's a cousin of a torus. It's, um, it's what's called a square tiled surface. I don't think I need to say why it's called a square tiled surface because it's pretty obviously tiled by squares, which means it's a branched cover of the torus branched over zero. And you can't make the exact same argument with the tetrahedron work because you cannot tile the plane with these pictures, but essentially you can use a, a variant of that argument to show that, this, that, that you don't get any of these trajectories on the cube as well. And now let me remark that the tetrahedron, the icosahedron, and the octahedron are all tiled by equilateral triangles. And so when you do the same construction with all of them, you get a surface that is tiled by rhombi. For the octahedron, you get a genus, um, you get a, uh, the octahedron, you get a genus, that's a three differential. Uh, you get a genus four surface. For the cube, a genus nine. For the icosahedron, a genus 25 surface. Uh, but all of them are cousins of the torus. And because of this, you can't build this. And by the way, everything I'm talking about right now is joint work with Pat Hooper, who is here for a month as part of the Morley program, and David Olesino. Um, and OK, so I should also say that these, the, for these polyhedra that you couldn't do it was known well before this. But this kind of gives a unified explanation. So there is the uh, icosahedron surface um, with all the gluings. Um, well. Yeah, you can sort of see what the gluing should be. And now, now we switch. Now we talk about the dodecahedron. So the dodecahedron now is different because pentagons, regular pentagons, don't tile the plane. They don't tile the plane. And now this surface, um, I really love this picture. This surface, of course, you can, I'm sure all of you can tell by looking at it as genus 81. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a genus 81 surface. But it also has a low genus cousin. Right? We don't want to study genus 81 surfaces by themselves, but we want to study their low genus cousin. And this one has a very, very nice low genus cousin, the low genus cousin, which is called the double pentagon. You may have seen it on one of the pictures outside um, in uh, the beautiful exhibition about Mariam that Anton developed. And it's a double pentagon because it's made up of two pentagons. These are the gluings. And this is a genus 2 surface now. Um, it's a genus two surface with one, it has now a point which has an angle of six pi. Um, if you look, look carefully, all the corners end up collapsing to one point. And this point has a, a, a cone angle of six pi, which is now kind of negative curvature. And of course, that's what you expect. If you flatten out a higher genus surface, you have to put the negative curvature somewhere. When we flatten out a sphere, we have to put the positive curvature somewhere. Now we have to put the negative curvature somewhere. So we put the negative curvature at this point. And now what we do is basically this surface is a degree 60 cover of this surface. There's, a, there's 120 pentagons in the previous picture, 10 times 12. 10 times 12 divided by 60 is 2. Um, and so this, that's why there's two pentagons here. And using this picture and a careful analysis of this double pentagon surface, we prove that there are 31 equivalence classes of what these, these closed saddle connections or closed singular geodesics, and 422 what are called maximal cylinders. And so I won't give you a definition, but a maximal cylinder is basically a family of straight lines that you just keep filling out until they close up. Um, I want to make the point that this, this double pentagon, the cousin of this surface, is very special. It's what's called a lattice surface or a Veach surface. It has a large automorphism group, a uh, large what's called affine automorphism group. In this case, the HECA 2-5 infinity triangle group. Um, the torus has SL2Z as its affine automorphism group, which is the HECA 2-3 infinity triangle group. So three and five, good cousin. I also want to make the point that this was, util this, this was done using the program FlatSurf, which I think, I think CIRM has, if not a formal role, a huge informal role in the development of the program FlatSurf because many of the people who developed FlatSurf first interacted and met at CIRM. So I should mention some names, Pat Hooper, Vincent Delacroix, Samuel Lelievre. Many other names are, are part of this project. It's an incredibly powerful computer program that helps you prove theorems. And OK, so now. 
I, I don't go through the details of the proof. The proof is basically you have saddle connections on the, on the double pentagon, you lift them up to this, G, this, this degree 60 cover, and then you see if they survive when you push them down. And then you check, and they do. Some of them do, not all of them. And here are some pictures. Here's one. Um, this is the simplest one. Um, that's what it looks like on uh, a kind of a net. Here's some more complicated ones on the net. Uh, they're no longer simple, right? They cross, they're allowed to cross themselves. Um, they become very, very complicated very, very quickly. Um, and now, I, I, let me just fit before, I wanna, show you, I wanna show you a short video at the end of this, but before I do that, I also wanna tell you a little bit about some more recent joint work um, with Dami Lee, who was a postdoc of mine at the University of Washington. Um, where we studied closed, we, we studied geodesics not now on a fixed platonic solid, but on triply periodic polyhedral surfaces. So you, these are pieces of these triply periodic polyhedral surfaces. So it's again one of those names I really like because it actually tells you what the definition is, right? I think you don't need to give a definition when you say triply periodic polyhedral surface. Um, it's three directions, and so this is called the jungle gym surface. You have these oct octagon oct surfaces made out of kind of different truncated octahedra and so on. And uh, let me just say that we, what we did is we were able to give quadratic bounds on counting the number of trajectories that start at one point and end at one vertex and end at another vertex. Again, these sort of singular geodesics, now not closed, but kind of singular geodesics here. And the reason I also wanted to mention this is, you know, these triply periodic surfaces are going to be part of the inspiration for the art that Allison is producing um, for CERN. Okay, so again, this is kind of the, the residue of a public talk, but you know, I don't think I need to convince anyone in this audience that geometry is this very living and breathing subject uh, and that computation and cal calculation play an enormously important role in the modern study of very pure, I mean, this is a very, very pure mathematical problem and we're using computation absolutely crucially at all parts of it. Um, so maybe I will, uh, I, maybe it's a good place to stop and ask for questions, and then I'll show a short video um, which has some nice animations that I'd like to share. Thank you very much. Impressive. Are there any questions? You said we have a quadratic estimates. So, okay, so what do I mean by that is if you want to count that, so now, of course, you might say there are some now, so I might say how many are there of length less than or equal to r? And that grows quadratically in r, and that's a, in this case, this is probably, this is a theorem of Veach, essentially, um, but in general for translation surfaces, this is work of Eskin Mazur, and then Eskin Mazur, Khani, Mohammadi give you weak quadratic asymptotics for every surface. But again, this is something you can see by looking at the torus. If you look at the torus and you count, if you put a fake singular point at zero and you look at closed trajectories connecting zero to itself, these are integer points in the plane. And so this is where, you, where, this is where the quadratic comes from. Dirk. I have an almost generic question. Uh -huh. Whenever I see something about platonic solids. Our, I have an almost generic question. Whenever I see something about platonic solids, my immediate reaction is, what about Archimedean solids? Yeah, this the natural generalization, is your theory general enough that you can apply it, or do you have 13 special cases to treat one after the other? 13 special cases that you have to treat one after the other is the short answer. <laughs> <laughs> the, reason, the reason being, um, these have, okay, part of the problem is Archimedean solids have faces which are different, right? They'll have two different kinds of faces. So, Unless the, I think the only Archimedean solid that is of each surface, so David and his students did some analysis of this. And I think the only one is the hexagonal antiprism, is Veach. Um, and so the translation covers of these Archimedean solids, it's an extremely interesting question because basically what you need to do is you need to understand their SL2 orbit closures. And I think they are an incredibly interesting source for looking at them, but at this point, and we should probably, now that flat surf can tell us what the orbit closures are, we should probably get back to David and tell his students to run it through flat surf. We haven't, I don't know that. I mean, David is probably doing that. But yes, I think as of right now, there really are 13 
as of right now, there are 13 different special cases. Maybe we analyze them and then we realize they're one thing, but I don't think so yet. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? I show the video? Yes. Perfect. Yes. Mathematical stories that we think are over keep going. Platonic solids are things that people have been thinking about for at least 2,000 years, and you might think there's kind of nothing new to say about them. But in the last couple of years, my colleagues and I have been exploring a facet of what it would be like to live on a platonic solid. And we've come up with some new ideas and some new theorems about them, particularly about the dodecahedron. You know, you might remember in school when you first learned about shapes, you know, there are triangles, and there are squares, and there's pentagons, and there's hexagons. And there's all these shapes in kind of two dimensions that all the sides are the same and all the corners look the same. But if you go a dimension up, you might want it to, to be that all the faces are the same, all the facets are the same, all the corners look the same, and all the edges look the same. And now it turns out there aren't infinitely many of those anymore. There's only five. There is the tetrahedron, which is a little pyramid with a triangular base. There is the octahedron, which looks like two Egyptian pyramids, one stacked on top of the other. There's the cube. Everybody knows the cube. There is the icosahedron. We've got a nice little beautiful icosahedron here. You can see it's, it's again made up of triangles. It's got 20 of them. And finally, there's the dodecahedron, which is made up unusually of pentagons. The other ones are all squares or triangles. The dodecahedron is made up of pentagons. It's made up of 12 pentagons. Three of them come together at each corner. So that's it. Those are the five, and they're known as platonic solids. They've played a big role in people's imaginations of mathematics and of art and of science. Kepler famously guessed that the, there might be these celestial arrangements of the platonic solids which the planets live on. Turns out that isn't the case. I study the geometry of surfaces. I like to think about the surface of these objects. When I say the surface of these objects, I want to think about what it would be like if you were a little insect living on one of these things. What would your experience of the world be like? Presumably, insects living on the surface is same. It's the same for all the platonic solids, though, isn't it? It's like living on a sphere, except you've got pointy bits. It's you would think so. So, but the pointy bits turn out to make a make a difference from the point of view of what's called a topologist, somebody who thinks about what we consider sort of rubber sheet geometry. All of these would be spheres. If you sort of blew up and sort of tried to make this as well rounded as possible, this would become a sphere. But I really do want to think about the pointy bits. Imagine on one of these platonic solids, there's a house on each corner where the mathematician lives. At each of the vertices, there's a house. And now, let's say you have your mathematician living at, at one of these houses, and she's an avid jogger. Every morning, she likes to go for a jog. On the other hand, you know, it's morning. She doesn't really feel like seeing any of her neighbors at this point. She wants to go for a jog. She wants to come back home to where she started. And she doesn't want to run through, certainly, any of her neighbors' houses. She would like to go on a path, and she doesn't want to have to sort of retrace steps or anything like that. She just wants to go straight and come back to where she started. We call this maybe the antisocial jogger problem. Another framing of it, if uh, there's this classic children's book, The Little Prince. And in the, one of the central tensions in The Little Prince, other than the loss of childhood innocence, the prince has a sheep on his planet and a rose. And he wants to prevent the sheep from eating the rose. So we could think about this generalized problem as the prince and the sheep live at one corner, and there's a rose at every other corner. And the prince wants, he's a good pet owner, responsible, wants to take his sheep out for a walk every day, but not walk it past the rose because then the sheep will eat the rose. Can he do that? Can he do that on a loop? So it's kind of like you almost want to make like, like an equator type shape. So it's a closed loop. It's like an equator or a longitude line or a latitude line. It, we're not asking for it to cut the thing in half. We're just asking to start at one corner, go on a straight line, and you never turn, you never pass through another corner. You might say, what happens when you hit an edge? But it makes perfect sense to go straight over an edge. You can just driving your car over a ridge or walking over a ridge. It is, however, a question about what it would mean to go straight when you hit a corner. For instance, here in the icosahedron, we have five triangles coming together at a corner. If you think about a flat piece of paper, you'd have to have six. You'd have to have 360 degrees. Here, I have five triangles, so I only have 300 degrees worth of angle. So this is another reason we don't want to pass through corners, because it doesn't make really sense to talk about what it means to go straight through a corner. It makes sense to go straight over a side, but it doesn't make sense to go straight over a corner. So the paths we want start at a corner, go straight, never ever turn, never pass through a corner, and come back to where you started. My sort of intuition is there must be thousands and millions of routes you can take, or are there none? So you're right 
you're right and you're right. So it, for some of the platonic solids, it's extremely easy to see that you can't do it. So I'm gonna first show you for the tetrahedron. This is something that's been known for a long time. In fact, the tetrahedron, the octahedron, the cube, and the icosahedron, spoiler alert, you can't do it on any of them. But people didn't know whether you could do it on the dodecahedron. And that's the question we ended up answering. We showed not only could you do it, there's lots and lots and lots of ways you can do it. The dodecahedron is the only one you can take your sheep for a walk on without having your roses eat. It's the only one you can be an antisocial jogger on without having to retrace your steps. With all of the other ones, the tetrahedron, octahedron, cube, and icosahedron, the shapes that, are, that make them up, in the icosahedron case, triangles, in the cube case, squares, in the octahedron and tetrahedron triangles, they end up tiling the plane. You could tile your infinite bathroom floor with copies of these things. You can't do that with a regular pentagon. Four of them, it was impossible, and that's long been known. That's long been known. We didn't know for the dodecahedron. We didn't know for the dodecahedron. How is that possible? Couldn't I just make a dodecahedron out of cardboard, get a Sharpie, and draw a line, and think, yeah, there you go, it was easy. So that's a really good point. You probably could do that. However, you wouldn't be sure that what you got was an exact mathematical trajectory. Maybe the thickness of your Sharpie you know, maybe there is one that's a little bit off. Even on the, on the other ones, probably by nudging a little bit, you could do that. So we wanted an exact, you know, straight line with no width, no thickness coming back to where it started. That little thickness of your marker, you know, you wouldn't know whether that, that actually gave you that exact mathematical answer or not. So I take it from that, that the, the paths that do do it, that we're about to talk about, only just miss the vertices then? They, surprisingly enough, the most simple one we found is one that you would look at and you would kind of draw by eye. To prove that it is one, though, is, is a little bit trickier. It's, it's shockingly simple to us. This is what made this project so much fun. This is with my friends Pat and David. We found a beautiful, simple, elegant solution, and it also has the advantage that it's visually very pretty. I want to prove to you that, at least in one of the cases, that you can't do it. I want to show you for the tetrahedron that you cannot do this because it illustrates an idea that we're going to use for the dodecahedron. It illustrates the idea of what's called unfolding. Let me start by drawing how I think of a tetrahedron. So a tetrahedron, of course, is this kind of pyramid shape with a triangular base. But like I said, I like to think about the experience of kind of living on the surface. I'm going to draw you a diagram to make a tetrahedron out of a flat piece of paper. This is called a net. I'm going to draw a big triangle sort of cut up into four. And then I'm going to draw you gluing instructions. So gluing instructions is that side gets glued to that side, that side gets glued to that side, and then that side gets glued to that side. If you were to fold up, you fold it along these internal edges, these guys end up glued up. And notice the direction of the arrows is important here. You know, going this way gets glued to going this way. And now I'm actually going to label the corners. If I think about folding this guy up, the very top, all these three guys end up folding up to this one point. So these are the four corners. And what I want to do is I want to draw a path that starts at one of these colored corners, comes back to itself, without passing through any of the other corners. I could try and draw it on here, but it might be easier to draw on here in kind of a map of this thing, where I just follow the identification. So, you know, for instance, if I were to start here and kind of go like that, well, now I'm here, and I would come like that, uh-oh, I've run into the blue, right? That's something I don't want to allow. To make this even clearer, notice here I was going along this way, and then I had turned around 180 degrees. Let me make a drawing where I never actually have to turn around. So I'm just going to draw a copy of this guy rotated by 180 degrees. And now I get a rhombus. Now I'm going to draw that rhombus for you without any of the distracting internal lines, but I am going to keep drawing these internal corners. So this very pretty decorated rhombus. But it's not just a rhombus. Notice the left side here is the same as the right side, and the top is the same as the bottom. You know, if you ever play the computer game Pac-Man, and of course as I get older and older, less and less people understand that reference, but most, many computer games, when you play on a screen, you go off one side, you come up the other. It's kind of this repeating world. And you go off the top, you come up the bottom. Asteroids. Asteroids. In fact, that's a better one because Pac-Man can only move parallel to the sides, and asteroids you can kind of move in any direction. So imagine playing asteroids on this parallelogram board. What we want is we want an asteroid trajectory that starts at one of these colored corners, goes straight, goes through these things, never passes through another corner, and comes back to where it started. But I'm actually now going to do one more piece of unfolding. I'm going to draw this picture as kind of repeating forever. I can tile an infinite room with copies of this rhombus. And now what you want to do is you want to draw a straight line starting at one color, ending at the same color without passing through any of these things. But notice, let's say I wanted to go from black to black. If I want to go from black to black, well, I could try and go diagonally, but the green blocked me. I 
I could try and go horizontally, but this blue blocks me. I could try and go vertically, and the red blocks me. No matter what I do, I'm blocked. And so these points block each other from accessing themselves. For the other platonic solids, other than the dodecahedron, the unfolding isn't quite as simple. You need to do more copies. So for instance, for the cube, the net for a cube is something that looks like a cross that you put together, and you need four copies of that. For the icosahedron, you need six copies. For the octahedron, you need three copies. For the dodecahedron, you need 10. There's also something really beautiful going on here. If you think about taking this parallelogram and gluing opposite sides, if you glue the left to the right, you get kind of a, a sheared tube. And then you glue the top and bottom of the tube, you get something that looks like a donut. This is called a torus or a genus one surface. Like biologists, we classify things into genera, into genus. And genus for us just means the number of holes. They're not so complicated, the other ones. The octahedron gives you a genus four surface the cube, a genus nine, when you do this unfolding procedure. This unfolding procedure leads to things that aren't too terribly complicated until you get to the dodecahedron, where the resulting surface, if you were to play Pac-Man on this crazy surface, it would be like living on a surface with 81 holes. And no, it's not an accident that the number of holes is always a square. We can talk about that at some other point. It goes one for the tetrahedron, four for the octahedron, nine for the cube, 25, for the icosahedron, and then 81 for the dodecahedron. Yeah. The dodecahedron, it was completely open. But the idea, the key idea from this is that the right place to look was in the unfolding. Because in the unfolding, what we traded is we've gone to a much more complicated shape, but now the trajectories we care about are just straight lines, and then once we go through a side, we just keep going straight in that direction. We never have to change direction. Here, we would have to turn 180. On the dodecahedron, we'd have to turn sort of a multiple of 72 degrees. But now we're just going straight by keeping track of all the copies. What's the dodecahedron got then? What's its special magic? So for the tetrahedron, you got what was called a torus. For all of these guys, you get something that looks kind of like a torus. It's called either square tiled or rhombus tiled. It's covered by tiles of this form. The dodecahedron covers something called the double pentagon. You got a tattoo. I got a tattoo. This is actually even before I worked on the dodecahedron, I had worked on this surface. So imagine playing Pac-Man on this surface. You glue this side to this side, this to this. You glue the parallel sides. So you go off this side, you come up here. And I had studied playing Pac-Man on this before, and I didn't know that it was gonna be relevant to the dodecahedron. It turns out, if you start with the dodecahedron, we said it started with 12 pentagons. And then I said I need to take 10 copies of this. That gave me 120 pentagons. In math, we call this, the construction where we, we have is we, it's a branched cover. There's 10, it's a degree 10 cover. But 120 pentagons, notice this thing is two pentagons, right? This is called the double pentagon. It turns out the dodecahedron unfolding, the thing with 120, is, a, is made up of 60 copies of this fellow. So on this fellow, if you glue these opposite sides, all the eight corners collapse to one point. So this guy gets glued to this guy, gets glued to this guy. So all these eight corners collapse to one point. If we could find things on here that connect this corner to itself, those would give us kind of candidates upstairs. Now it turns out there's kind of two different kinds of things here. There's these sides, they clearly connect a corner to itself. There's also the kind of the diagonals. This guy would go across and connect to itself. We call these the short and the long. The sides are short, the ones are long. It turns out if you kind of take copies of the short one up on this genus 81 surface, the short ones never work. They will never give you something that starts at a corner and comes back to itself without passing through another. However, the long ones do. Sometimes, not all of them. And in fact, up to a natural notion of equivalence, which I don't want to get into too much here, there's, you can classify the kinds of closed trajectories into 31 types. And we found the shortest guy in all of these 31 classes. And we have pictures of them and we have animations of them. Of course, in each of these 31 classes, actually there's infinitely many of these. Um, and we can in fact count them by how many there are of length less than or equal to let's say 1,000. We know how to do that as well. So we started with a question that nobody knew the answer to. Started a corner of a dodecahedron, 
can you come back to where you started? Nobody had done, known the answer to that. People had been thinking about that particular problem for at least 100 years. There's German mathematicians in 1906 who wrote a paper uh, about it. And we came to a very satisfying answer. The simplest answer is really simple. We have a paper, in fact, where it has my favorite proof I've ever written. The theorem is, yes, such a trajectory exists. The proof is, here's a picture, cut it out and glue it together. So apologies to libraries if people are reading this paper. Maybe they are cutting this paper out and putting it together. Hopefully there aren't too many mangled copies of the American Math Monthly. But then we also have a really sophisticated and in some sense very satisfyingly complete answer of, hey, not only did we find one, we understand all of them. What's the fundamental difference between the 31 different ways? Like if I was using path one or path two, yeah. what, how would I know the difference between the two? So one thing you can notice is path one, for instance, never crosses itself, and path two already starts to cross itself. Path one is what's called simple, and path two is not. You're crossing over a, a point you've already crossed over. So maybe you're doing a jogging path where you pass by that same tree twice. That's, um, that's something that can happen, and that's a simple way. The number of self-intersections of the path is a simple way to maybe tell the types apart. Um, the actual equivalence is what's called affine equivalence. These things are, are we're gluing things together with translations, and so you can, you can always just change the whole picture by what's called a change of coordinates. You can stretch and contract and rotate, and if you can do that in a way that takes one path to the other, we consider two equivalent. Um, and the number of self-intersections is kind of a, what we call an invariant in mathematics. That's one way you can tell these 31 apart. What's it like to have discovered something new about a platonic solid? That's like finding out something new about pi or something. It was, it's one of the most satisfying and exciting things. When David, Pat, and I talked about this, or when David and I first talked about the dodecahedron, we joked, oh, it would be cool to say something new about platonic solids, you know? There's, you know, uh, what is it, it's in Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun, but it turns out there is something new about platonic solids. It was, it was really fun because it used mathematics I already knew and I already loved. Clearly, I already loved it. And I was able to say something new, and I was able to say something that I can share with lots of people. This is something I really care about. Uh, and in fact, you know, we are, we have, we've made activities for schools and so on based on this. It's something that uses very interesting and very sophisticated mathematics um, to answer a question that you can state very easily. And so if there's any sort of big point to this is there's still lots of really interesting, simple questions out there. Math is something that's alive, that's growing, that's changing. Even the oldest stuff we think about there's a ton new about it. Have you given any of these paths names, especially the simple one? Yeah, we should give it a name. The simple one, we should, you know, I, I don't know what we should call it. If I'd, I'd welcome suggestions in the comments. Um, but, you know, this one is maybe, maybe, maybe we could give them names. Maybe one could be the, the 5K, one could be the 10K, one could be the, uh, one could be the marathon, depending on how long they are. Thinking more like, you know, the magic line or the the yellow, the yellow brick road. The yellow brick road, that's a fantastic, fantastic idea. I love that idea. One of the things that's still very wide open is understanding kind of the properties of these lines. For instance, even that simplest one, we haven't yet computed whether it cuts the dodecahedron in half. If we were to cut the dodecahedron, we don't know the areas of the two halves yet. It shouldn't be too hard to compute, we just haven't done it yet. So if somebody out there, the, the coordinates are out there in the paper, you're more than welcome to compute that and let us know what it is. For the other ones, they're going to cut it into more pieces, but what's the kind of the areas of the pieces it's cutting the shape into? What do those shapes look like? So this is the great thing about answering any mathematical question, is it actually just generates infinitely more questions. Thanks for watching this video, and a special thanks to our Patreon supporters, including those whose names you see on the screen at the moment. This video was filmed at the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute during one of the programs there. Find out more about MSRI in the video description. And to see all the dodecahedrons with their magical paths, including of course the yellow brick road, we've put some extra footage over on number file 2. Thank you very much. Oh.